Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives, and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that i've been doing over the last 15 years or you can use their guided optimization with this they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint after that conversation they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done and then from there get the labs done they'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription americhealth.com backslash table talk the discount code is table talk Today's episode is brought to you by Power Rack Strength CBD. Power Rack Strength was founded by Brian Carroll, a good friend of mine. I've been thrown many products over the years, literally thrown many products over the years, which was all junk. So of course I was gonna bust Brian a little bit when he first came out with this until he explained to me how much research and who his partners were that were associated with his company. Then after he sent me some of the samples to test, I was absolutely blown away by the drops. As with most people, I have a hard time falling asleep. I'm cool when I'm asleep, but I have a hard time falling asleep. These were the only thing that actually helped me out of all the different things that I've tried in the past. It definitely makes a difference in my training. So check out PowerRackStrengthCBD.com. Use the code TABLETALK2023 and you'll receive 35% off your first order. If I'm pushing anything, I'm pushing the drops first, then I will push the roller second. The bomb is good, but I'm just not a bomb guy. I am stuck, guys, because I don't know if I'm supposed to say, what's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Table Talk, because it's not Table Talk. This is a, a crew edition of the podcast or the Table Talk that the people who... This is kind of weird explaining this one because we're going to push this one out live or not live, but we're going to push this one out to everybody so they can see kind of what we're going to do with the crew podcast. If you guys remember when I was promoting the crew earlier on, I said after we hit 200 members, we're going to start doing Q only Q and A's AMAs. And this is what this episode is going to be. So I have three main topics or questions that came to me through our crew discord server which to join the crew click the link in the description obviously the people that are going to be hearing this first are on the crew and any episodes that we do proceeding will just be crew only so you can join the crew again by going to the description the three topics that i have today the first one was one <clears throat> that we got pretty close to 200 about a month ago and then it just ceased to grow and then last couple of weeks it kind of came up to the 200 but one of the topics that was originally presented was a topic of how to auto regulate your training so i'm going to talk about that i'm going to talk about the evolution of my time at west side just the changes i saw during west side then i'm going to talk about conjugate made simple the suggestion here and this is something that i'll just continue with each um, crew episode moving forward was if you go back into the podcast and you go back on our youtube you're going to find a couple conjugate 
only table talks that I did. I can't give you the numbers of those right now, even though I should have prepared for those to be able to give you the numbers. I'm going to say around the 60th range. They're not that hard to find. If you just tape, you know, just search Dave Tate conjugate method, it should come up with that. And I simplified the conjugate method. <laughs> I'm laughing because I simplified it in two 90 minute podcasts, which if you want to call three hours simplifying something, then so be it. But it is what that is and what was suggested is that i just take some of those components and do a little bit deeper dive into those so the one thing i have on my notes here to go a little bit deeper into is the squat waves because i think that's one of the biggest components as far as putting it together so the order of the topics that i'm going to go over i'm going to start with the evolution of west side and then i'm going to move into the auto regulation and then the the squat waves with the conjugate made simple part so the way the question was presented on the evolution of west side was what were some of the changes that i saw when i was there i got there in around 91 there's an article on elite fts called which i'm going to be referencing the west side i remember by dave tate so if you just search dave tate the west side i remember elite fts will pop up the first thing I want to get into would be the the rules, just because it's first in the article, because it's they're funny and they're funny to think back on. And some of these are actually a little humorous to me as well, because when we started allowing people to come out to the different compounds that we've had over the years, a lot of the rules that we made were to not have the rules that were basically in place when I was during my time at Westside, which was 90, 99 through 2002, three, four, whatever, whatever it was, about 12 to 14 years. And these are the rules that I remember. You know, the, there, were, there were no rules on the board. It wasn't like you walked in there and there was on the wall these list of rules. So all these things are just pretty much unwritten rules or rules that you figure out really quick are the standards that were associated with being there. So standards is probably a better word than the rules. The first one would be in the list that I have it here, you know, powerlifting was your number one priority. That should kind of be obvious at that time, but that that's part of what created that culture that was in there. Don't miss sessions ever. Don't be late ever. And that was, looking back i can see the reasons why for a lot of these different things the um the don't be the not be late i kind of get that one but that was one of those that i changed for my own gym because shit happens you know people get caught up in traffic work or whatever it's going to be so a few minutes here and there is not that big of a deal but when i was there it was a big deal because i was part of the morning crew and I had to be back at work by 1130. So I didn't really have time, nor did a lot of the other people that I was training with that had to get out of there because of work related reasons as well. We didn't have time to fuck around waiting for somebody for an hour or whatever it was going to be. So I believe at the time of 830 was our start time. The consistency as far as don't miss that really wasn't something that i mean most people just accepted that's what it's supposed to be most people wanted to be there i mean it wasn't like people didn't want to be there and but that consistency means a lot because you need spotters you need loaders and sometimes you you're not going to be 100 percent, and you need these other people to help drive you to be that 100 percent. and if people aren't showing up and they're not consistent that's not going to be the case so if they were inconsistent or not showing up they would be essentially asked to leave but more people left on their own free will than were ever asked to leave uh, you competed if you didn't compete you weren't going to stay there that was part of it as well that gave purpose to the training and 
Um, once once you commit to a meet, you do the meet. This may have changed over there. I'm only talking about the time I was there. So if you committed to a meet, you did the meet no matter what. So if you're injured, you figured out how to do the meet, or you might have just benched 135, or you just benched the bar if it was a torn pec or something like that, but you didn't pull out of the meet. And that that actually paid off to my benefit because a lot of the meets that I did the best in were the meets that I could have pulled out in because of being injured but you know the injury you know heals or it, you found a way around it to be able to compete and some of those were actually my better meets the meets that I was I thought were going to go better usually didn't end up being that case the during our dynamic effort sessions bench deadlift squat you never sat down it was you you sat down somebody was going to be yelling at your ass the um make make the other lifters better than you i've talked on that before in the past i'm just scanning this list here leave the drama outside the door when we were training we were training all the other stuff like i said just got left outside um, go to meets to help your team and then you paid your own way to do that so being broke as fuck this was not an easy one for me not at any any stretch of the imagination so you had to figure out you know how to get your ass to a meet to be able to help other people with nothing with being broke as fuck so that was always an interesting experience to be able to do that but that you knew that they would do the same for you in return we were only we only entered the open division there were no entering the master's division there was no sub master's division they, these were all divisions but louis was really big on you only enter the open division which that didn't really make any difference to me because i i was kind of brought into the sport my entire career with that the i know the program have a basic understanding of the program keep your hands off the board you know there are no cameras and that was this is before cell phones and stuff like that where i'm sure after i left in later years this changed a little bit but i think some of the older images that you might see of west side louis louis let me bring in a digital camera once maybe twice you know to take pictures for articles the website his website and then the only real filming that was ever done were for the videos that he was filming the vhs videos the dvd videos and that was it you know all the other shit was left outside he felt that was a distraction make the gym bread or if you get called out stand up so in other words if somebody called you out for whatever reason if they started working up in weight you worked up you didn't cower down um training hard was was to be expected you know if you can't handle it then you leave it's that simple and some of that has pushed back some of the some of these things are interesting now because looking back 20 years into that and seeing how the, these things would have been presented back then this ends up being one of those things that well then that's how louis ended up getting the better lifters because if they couldn't survive you know they just they would leave you know so the kind of like the bulgarian approach is you know run them into the ground if they can't survive then fuck them that's not what this was it wasn't about that you know if they couldn't trained to the standard that was required to make themselves better and everybody else that was in there better then all they're going to do is to pull everybody else down it was more about that it wasn't trying to weed people out that just for the sake of weeding them out because there are there were a lot of times that i was there more more times than you would think that i would go in to the the morning crew and it would be myself chuck louie and kenny patterson the four people and say three or four weeks before that we might have had 15 and then we're down to four and we're you know louie's asking us like hey can you get we need more guys can you bring other people in it's like 
the hell I what am I going to do you know I work as a personal trainer in a club with fucking gen pot people that's the only place I go is the gym and work how am I going to bring people in and then eventually more people would kind of come back in and there would be a rotation but it wasn't this wasn't because we're throwing people out or they're burning them out there's just there was a natural attrition that was just associated with it to begin with and if they didn't meet the standard it was better to just have the three or four people that did than to have 15 people and the majority of them not because then that hurts the overall culture and everything else that's going on in there um stay out of the bullshit which is kind of the drama as well the uh some of the funny ones that i put on this in this article is you know don't get married you know the louis was big on that sometimes i don't know if this was joking around or serious it's probably a little bit of both you know the spouse would just fuck up your training um don't bring wives and girlfriends to meet so again the same type of thing um, i don't know if he was actually 100 percent serious about that or fucking around but if um if he felt that the significant other was hurting the person's meat performance then it was it you know i guess you could say it would be right but on the flip side of that i also knew others that you know their wives were there and they did better because of that so he, another one he was big on don't have kids that just fuck your training up um don't don't date strippers and use crack that was another one that was he, he basically would always say the things that ruin the lifters more than anything else are strippers and crack and after being there for all the years that i was there i would agree with exactly everything that he said in that regard now getting to things that i saw from the evolution from the training standpoint when i first came in there was power racks a squat stand because when i first came in it was still it was a very 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 tail end of a commercial gym i'm talking maybe two months and I never really even trained in that because that's when I was driving back and forth. So I might have had one or two training sessions in that place before he moved to the boxer in the basement gym. But <clears throat> there's so there were power racks, there were commercial machines and shit out that and, you know, the, the front area. But in the powerlifting area, that was really about it. So there's a list here and I was going to read read through the list but there's probably over a hundred different things but i'm just going to skim through here and talk about some of these where when i first got there some of the things that i remember is when i was able to start doing the dynamic squat work the one of the things that sucked is whoever i was training sets with you always went off whatever their height of the squat stands were so if it was louie you know he's taking the squat stands shit probably five six inches lower than what i would typically take them but i had to take the bar out wherever he was taking the bar out and so when it starts jacking your back up and your erectors get tired you know one of the things that he would say and make you know crack back on you is is it's just because your lower back's weak so we didn't have a monolith they were just regular squat stands and there were you know i remember it's probably easier to say here's the things that i remember come in just assume that what that what was there at the time was nothing probably less than what anybody who's listening to this right now has access to train with now including what they would have access to in their garage gym there were dumbbells i can't even say it was a complete set of dumbbells there were dumbbells in the weights that the people in the gym would use there were <clears throat> power racks maybe two maybe two power racks and one squat stand if i remember correctly i don't even think there was a competition bench there might have been a flat dumbbell bench maybe a ghr a lap pull down machine and a few other things i'd really kind of have to really think about that where the there were no bands there were no chains none of that stuff was was there at all i would say the chains probably came in two three years after i was there and then the bands came in a couple years after that maybe a year and a half i 
time wise I can't remember exactly but they were not at the same time there was a gap between that there was pro I, I can say there were two meets that I did between those two maybe even three with just the chain so it, we went from just the straight weight for years by the way and then from the straight weight going to waving in the chains and then figuring out different waves for the chains and then getting into the bands and then the bands progressing from that point there some of the other things that i saw come in while i was there and then some some kind of went out some came in there was a lot of experimentation with things that came in so things would come in for a little bit of time and then wave their way back out the just to kind of go through this list i remember weight releasers coming in you know that was kind of like a new thing that we're messing around with they stayed in for quite a long period of time but not as frequently as what people would typically think they were um, i remember board presses coming in when i first got to west side the um the max effort exercises because it was conjugate conjugate when i got there the squat waves were in five week cycles and the max effort exercises were rotating i think at that time they were rotating maybe every two weeks could have been three weeks i could be wrong if it was three weeks and it was a pin press then the pin changed each week before we went to the next one shortly shortly after that it started to change every single week but to give you guys an idea on the bench work for the bench max effort work there were pin presses of different pin heights there were floor presses there were close grip bench presses and there were uh, steep close grip incline presses there were not board presses because we didn't know of board presses at that time so board presses weren't utilized i saw those come into the gym the floor presses actually i saw come into the gym as well so the floor presses came in maybe about a year after i was in there like i said just here the dynamic cycles went from five weeks down to three the max effort cycles went from three weeks down to changing every single week um, the change of assistant exercises were they were always changing always evolving the reverse hyper was there the very first time i walked into a west side barbell and it was before it was patented and we weren't allowed to tell anybody about it and it jacked your back up and it was basically just a weight that went around your ankles on a strap but that was always in there the i do believe the glute ham raise was one of the other things that was always in there those things were always a huge part of the training program they're always in the training program they they did wave but they didn't wave in and out they waved as far as the intensity and the volume is how they were put in there gpp was something that i saw added you know as far as sled training and any kind of just any of that gpp work was in there louis i can say he was kind of doing some of this stuff when i first got there because i remember and i don't know if he was just fucking with me but one of the things that <laughs> one of the things he would try to talk us into doing at least me i don't know maybe some of the other guys is walk his dog around the fucking um football field and this you didn't walk the dog the dog basically was dragging your ass and it took everything in your power just to be able to stay on your feet so it was just nothing more than this eccentric contraction of trying to not get fucking pulled on your face all the way through and by the time you were done you were sweating your ass off and breathing hard so i suppose that was gpp that kind of came in there but the sled work came in a few years after i was in there so gpp came in part of it um, trap bars came in and then they got thrown the fuck out really quick um, overhead presses were not really a big part of the training then they came in as overhead pin presses and so there was the the man array was another thing it's an attachment that goes on the bar which at first you're going to look at and say who the hell would ever use that but what it ended up doing was making a higher bar position so the manta rays were used on a higher box squat they stayed in for quite a long time they moved out when specialty bars started to come in like the 
the cambered squat bars, stuff like that. The safety squat bar was always in there. Um, stability balls, I saw them come in. The cambered bars, I saw them come in. Um, lactic acid tolerance training, I saw that come in. You know, so I can go on, if you go to this article, I don't want to go through everything, but it goes into, you know, all the different things, circumax periods, different training waves, um, fat bars, all these things in its one, two, three, probably four pages of things in the decade that I was there, I saw introduced to Westside Barbell through Louie or through somebody that asked Louie to try something out. And I, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff that came in that didn't get utilized or got utilized once or twice but we didn't think there he didn't think it's a better thing he didn't think there was a big enough purpose to be able to keep it in the important thing to consider with this is it's always evolving you know it, it was always evolving so when that was one of the reasons why if people would ask questions about you know what do you what did you do at west side even when i was there it was hard to ever tell them what we really well, i can say what we were doing and i could say what we did but i couldn't really say what we were going to do because that was always evolving in all the time the the main things never when, when something was determined to work, three week squat waves, for instance, you know, certain percent ranges, for instance, when they, they were much slower to change than some of the other things that were coming in is like testing type stuff. And the off season, if you want to call it that, so the time period where there really wasn't any meets, more, more of the changes would be utilized to determine what things would be the most productive while training for a meet. So when when that period started to lock in, whatever you what today would be called as meat prep, which kind of makes me laugh because the whole year is kind of meat prep. But the um, when that period would come in, change wasn't as prominent because it was more about you know peaking and doing everything that you knew was going to work to this highest ability the some of the some of the other things that came with this was you know and I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a picture of kenny patterson doing the overhead pin press and the we didn't we didn't have zero to 90 benches you know, it, it was it was a flat bench with a two by eight knee wrapped, you know, with the J cups, which weren't J cups, they were screws, knee wrapped to the screws in the power rack so it wouldn't move. That provided the back support. That's how you did the overhead pin presses. The way that we did the close grip incline presses or the incline presses is we simply just took the flat dumbbell bench stacked it on boxes behind it at different heights and that's what the incline was so the the steep incline would have been whatever the box squat was turned so it was 18 inches and then that would sit on top of i think the three board press and then behind the three board press would be a one board press so it wouldn't slip back a little bit so you knew the steep incline was the 18 the 18 inch box with the three board press and that so that was how that was determined the the slight incline would have been like the the bench on the four board press so you just kind of remembered what the setup was by that so we didn't need all these different pieces of equipment to be able to get fucking strong i mean we just utilized what was in there and progressed from that standpoint some of the other things that that i'm trying to think of some of the things that came didn't work for shit like the trap bar was one that came didn't work for shit and got that didn't not, not last long at all it maybe 
I'm being really generous by saying six weeks, but that was fucking tossed because it was, it doesn't do shit for the posterior chain where all we were concerned about is building up the posterior chain. So that came and go really, really fast. The Tendo unit, you know, came and went really, really fast too. And that was more so because it was fucking up people's technique because we're more concerned about who could who could press at the fastest not whose number would look better instead of what technique would look better so it kind of came to the demise of what the technique was some of the there were some things i'm trying to think of the one thing because there there was one that man i i'd love to be able to fucking remember what this was too there was something that some dude sent louis and sent to the gym and it was it was a piece of shit i mean it it did not help for shit and it it wasn't it wasn't even constructed i mean it was literally a piece of shit whatever it was so it ended up immediately in the dumpster and then and then whoever this guy was you know wanted wanted louis to send it back and it's fucking long gone and so then was convinced that we were actually using it and then started telling people that we were actually using it and that we didn't throw it away and that we it was that that i guess you had to be there at the time but that was funnier in hell because louis gets so fucking mad because this guy was going around telling people we were using whatever this piece of shit thing was and we didn't and we threw it the fuck away and this guy was convinced that we really really liked it because louis wouldn't send it back and i don't know if he you know didn't have the heart to be able to tell me throw it away but i seriously doubt louis wouldn't have the heart to be able to tell somebody that um i can't think i can't think of what that is i'm trying to kind of go off the cuff with some of these answers here too is as i did with some of the original table talks because questions would come in and i'm answering the questions just like if we were sitting here talking i got some notes to kind of go off of but that's right keep it with that the getting back to the evolution of the time period that i was there it was all the the biggest things the biggest takeaways that i saw were the the emphasis on technique became more and more and more every single year it was it was big when i went there my first squat workout i believe was just with matt demo and the the amount of verbal cues that i had was it was fucking ridiculous compared to things i was used to things that i was used to before that would have been some verbal cues while i was doing the lift but mostly motivational shit you know up up you know had you know stuff like that where and then after the session i would have somebody say look man you gotta you know keep your feet flatter keep the weight back on your heels or whatever they were telling me at the time where this was during the session constantly and that was always kind of part of it where the longer over the years while i was there it became more and more a part of it and i think it's because the 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 guys that were lifting there were picking up on the things that louis was looking for the most so I, I cannot sit here and say that we all picked up on every single thing louis was looking for because that would be a lie you know there's there's no way anybody was going to do that with all the experience and wisdom that he had you know for the sport and the list but we picked up on a lot of the major things that he was looking for and then we could start to see it in each other and then that's what we would be watching you know so if we were watching somebody go through their dynamic squat workout we're not impressed with the weight or how fast the weight's moving or any of that bullshit we're watching you know what is the bar doing you know where's where's the chest position where's the head position where's the feet where's the knees what are all these things doing and then people are cueing that out and typically people would be cueing out different things so it wouldn't be everybody yelling the same thing you know each person would be yelling out whatever they were seeing at that time and yes you can hear as the lifter you're not going to hear everybody but you're going to hear enough of it to be able to make the corrections and be able to make that difference that became especially on the dynamic work that became huge that became a a much more vital part of the dynamic training than all the other aspects now when the 
bands started to come in and then the top tension started to go higher you know it's then there was more aggression needed you know so that would kind of be worked in there a little bit so it became a little bit harder you know to hear all of the cues when the weight is that hard so you got to hope a lot of it by that time is ingrained and automatic with the max effort work that ended up becoming not so much a technical thing because not a lot of those exercises were technical in nature they were just straining in nature brutal in nature so that became more a matter of learning how to strain for longer periods of time in different positions where when I first got there and that was just probably my maturity as a lifter it started out as just being you know just muscle fuck and lift whatever the weight is however you need to lift it with as much aggressive force as you can possibly have and then over a period of time I learned to have to dial that down a little bit not not to the point that it, you're not trying not even close to that point but that you're doing it without um over the top aroused state because it became too hard to recover and it also ended up being a weird thing for myself personally because the weights would either move too fast or then they or they would move you know fall out of the groove so it, it was a straining type of thing other parts of the evolution part of that was the meats became it became more about the meats than the training in a real fucked up way I'm hesitant because I'm not too sure I know how to explain what I'm trying to say here the um, the perform it's the, the culture was basically anybody could run their mouth say all, all they wanted to say and then it ended up being take it to the meat you know you can say whatever you want but just take it to the meat then you're only as good as whatever your last meat was so the, the meats mattered they always mattered you know for me i can only speak for myself here for me they started to matter more they started to matter a fuck ton more where before the meats were just the end product of however the training went that shift you know had to happen because then the meat became basically how you were rang judged and seen which is kind of fucked up i don't know if i'm actually saying that properly you know in in the group to where that that mattered more so so then it it changes your over a period of time it changes your focus to here's things that i'm willing to do you know before the meet here's things i'm willing to do outside of the meet there's certain things that need to be you know brought up during the meet and i'm not talking drugs i'm just talking as far as whatever the exercises or specialty exercises or max effort exercises or the circuit max and all this other kind of stuff it's like these are all like things that i was going to do more before the meet and i had to be prepared to be able to handle those things so say a circa max phase for instance you know it used to be i need to peak for the meat right and then it was no i have to actually be prepared not peaked i have to be prepared to actually go into the circa max phase because that took a higher level of preparedness than what was normally required for being five six seven or whatever number of weeks that was going to start out from the meat which meant that you know the the two months blocks or however you want to see it leading into that became more meat centric than then the whole off off season right the the whole outside period became more vital that the strength did not drop really at all you know you wanted to try to maintain it as much as you possibly could in such a way that you weren't going to be pushing the boundaries 
too high to where it, you weren't going to be prepared for when that circumax phase rolls into that so now i can only speculate based upon guests that i've had out here and the guys that have followed the podcast can kind of see you know what things have changed since i departed in whatever time 2003 we'll just say until you know the 20 years preceding that in the training changed you know the different things change for different reasons if you go and listen to Hoff's podcast and um, Wenning's podcast and Luke Edwards podcast and AJ Roberts podcast you're going to see you know different insights on some of the things that they saw you know changed after I was there that you know they got more into gear that was a big thing one of the one of the biggest misconceptions of the time period that I was there which is always an interesting one to me because a lot of people like to speak and talk about the the duration that I was there and how everybody trained during the time that I was there with certainty with without even fucking being there which is really odd to me and th which I don't I don't quite understand that but you know supposedly you know everything that we did was because we trained in gear but yet we only put it on fucking twice a year you know so it, that was something that evolved that helped get more out of the gear later years definitely but when the whole time period that I was there they I don't think I ever put my SWAT suit on more than maybe once that was not in a meet I never put knee wraps on unless it was at a meet. The hell, even the briefs that I used in training were not the same briefs as I used in a meet. Bench shirt might have been put on once, maybe twice in the 16 weeks or 20 weeks leading up to a meet. And that's maybe for a long period of time, it wasn't even used at all. It was just put on at the meet. And those are things that changed at a later time that i think was a good thing to change at a later time but it, it kind of takes the whole steam out of the argument that everything that we were doing back then was simply just for gear you know and because that's we we, we could have just as well gone to the meet and not used the fucking gear i'm not saying we would have lifted the same amount of weight but we most certainly could have done that because all the training was raw you know so it it was it was more of a lack of specificity of us not wearing the gear than had we been training in the gear so or whatnot with that and there's other things too as far as phasic structures and all those which i've talked about in other podcasts before which i don't want to get too long-winded on this um that's a quick summary and as we move forward with these crew only podcasts i can go a little bit deeper if i'm given a specific area to speak about this was kind of a broad stroke on that but i'm more than happy to go deeper with that so the next topic i want to get into is going to be on auto regulation and this is something that has been one of my main objectives for the last decade was to make people aware that i feel the most important attribute that a lifter needs to learn in the training process is their ability to auto regulate their training or get to a point to where they know how to auto regulate everything in their training now if it is a beginner this no it's not the case and even an intermediate it's not the case but the process should start to where they're trying to figure things out i've seen too many people go from you know good to great just simply by learning how to figure some of the smaller intricacies of training out for themselves that it's fucking unbelievable and some of that it required people leaving a coach that they were with before and then just doing it themselves and then because of that they 
go through the roof. Some of it involved maybe working with a different coach that's going to make them more accountable and responsible, you know, for some of the other smaller, some of the decisions in the gym that are going to make some of the biggest differences. But it's, it's happened enough times that I'm convinced it's, it's, 100 percent necessary i'm also convinced it's 100 percent necessary because you can take everybody that's in the top i don't know what percent i'm just going to throw something out fictitiously so we'll just say the top five percent of all lifters of any generation and then show me how two of them did exactly i mean exactly everything the same way and you're going to find you're, you will not be able to show me any two people that did everything exactly the same way. And if you think that you can, and then I could actually sit down and speak with those people, say I did a two hour podcast with each one of them. I'm pretty sure we would find a lot of shit that they did differently that didn't account to that. But what you can see looking through all the lifters that I've had as podcast guests that are amongst the best of the best is the one thing that they share across the board is their ability to be able to pivot and regulate their training based upon what they think they need to do and how they feel where that message is huge and that message can also be very silenced and sometimes it feels like I'm screaming it into a fucking hurricane because you have so many coaches who are trying to silence that message because they don't want that. They don't want their lifters to be accountable or self-sufficient, which is not the best coaches, by the way, the best coaches do. You know, the other ones want to be able to, they think that they're going to lose their client base or whatever the fuck they think by doing this where they're actually not. They're going to be able to build a bigger client base because the, the results are going to be better. So what comes back to me is how do you do that? You know, how do you learn how to auto regulate your training? And that can be a very complex very long discussion where i'm gonna start by saying you're already doing it more than you think that you are so by that i'll just use how you feel when you walk into the gym so if you walk into the gym and you're you have a, a piece of paper or you know, a, a template on your phone or whatever the fuck it is that you're using for to guide your training. You're going to see what's on there. You're going to walk in the gym and you're going to think, man, I don't feel like I'm ready to start yet. So then you might do some of this. You might do some of that. And then after you do that, you're like, okay, I feel good. I'm good enough to start or maybe not. Maybe you do a little bit more or sometimes you walk in. It's like you're already ready to roll. So it's like whatever the warm up is, fuck it. You're just going to go straight and you're just going to do more warm up sets with the bar or whatever it's going to be. You're already doing it. So you're already to a certain degree, a lesser degree, auto regulating a lot of the aspects of your training. So once you have that in mind and just take some time to think about that, think about the things that you do in the gym currently that do not exactly match up to whatever your program says you're supposed to do so the rest periods are they exactly what the program says you're supposed to do they're probably not you know do you do exactly always the same number of sets you might but for the most part sometimes you might not be you might have trimmed a warm-up set you might have added a warm-up set maybe you do everything exactly that's in there as it's supposed to be there's probably been a time to where there was a certain exercise that just didn't feel right you know it, it hurt or whatever it was so then you might have gutted through it or you might have got a hold of your coach or ask whoever's coaching you hey this fucks my elbow up is there something else i can do or you just did something else to be able to do that i can give tons of examples with that but the only point i'm trying to make is you're already starting to do those things where 
a lot of times people will question those things is they don't know what they're doing or it might be the wrong thing where what I'm saying is you might actually be starting to lean into more of the right things from that. But before I get too far ahead of myself, there are some things if you're looking at just auto regulation of training that are broad that need to be thought about and defined before we go down that rabbit hole too much. The first one would be, you know, the athletes, the lifters assessment. Like what, what is the physical, uh, what is your physical assessment? You know, is everything perfect? Does everything feel great? Do you have any nicks? Do you have any twinges? Do you have any, you know, pre-existing injuries? Do you have something that's always tighter than something else? Like what, what is this physical state that you're in? Because you got to define what that is. Because if you can't define what that is, and then something becomes out of what that physical state is, then that is something that would be a cue to be able to tell you something probably needs to change. But if you haven't put enough thought into being able to establish what that actually, what that assessment is, from the jump, you don't know what's out. Or out, or out of context, or not out of context. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Sometimes I have this really fucked up feeling on my forearm, right, right there. If I hit it, sometimes it hurts like a bitch. Been going on forever, but I always forget about it because it doesn't happen all the time. It might happen a few times a week, but if I'll, I. For years, I always forget to even acquire or ask my doctor, like, what the fuck could this be? I always forget, because it's not that big of a deal, I always forget, right? So that's a shitty job of my self-assessment, but it doesn't, it's not a big deal. It's not like my shoulder, you know, that's going to be fucked up all the time. Probably a better example would be if you're training and then one day your shoulder feels a little fucked up not bad but a little messed up but then that next training session it's fine it, it feels perfect like nothing ever happened something is still in the prog process of being weird for whatever reason but you get four five six sessions down the road and you forget about what that was that one time long enough away from it you're going to forget it even existed at the first point so that assessment i'm not telling you to do this detailed assessment but what i am telling you is to have some type of physical assessment on where is this baseline so you know if it's out of whack or if it's out of baseline or too far into baseline that way you know from there the next factor is going to be what are the performance objectives of the athlete what are you training for this matters as well where if you're just training for health and fitness then yes your ability to auto regulate your training is going to have some bearing on what it's going to be but it's going to have a much larger bearing if you're trying to be the best power lifter or the best bodybuilder or the best strength athlete or whatever it is in the world you know so that needs to be taken in consideration and always at the top of your mind what that is what is the goal of what you're doing the other one would be a basic sport analysis which i don't want to get too much into that but what i'm walking you through here is a basic needs analysis that's going to be associated with any training program if you have a coach or you are the coach you should be doing this you know most athletes or most people that are being coached by somebody else may not have they, this may not ever have been part of the program process they just been thrown a program or they're just using a program that they saw out there and never did a full needs analysis of themselves what i'm saying is take the time to be able to do a needs analysis because it's going to be able to provide metrics to be able to show you what's out of the norm and what is the norm so a lot of that is going to be as i said the assessment of the athlete the performance objectives the sports analysis the training history of the athlete the physical and psychological profiles i mean all these different just 
Google, right? Just Google needs an analysis of a strength and conditioning program. This is pretty well known, easy, low hanging fruit stuff to be able to go through. And I'm not saying that you need to take weeks to be able to write this like a business plan or something like that. All I'm saying is develop a baseline of for the fifth time we develop a baseline i say things multiple times for a reason because it's important because if again if you're going to try to auto regulate something then you need to know what the fucking anchor is right so this is what's going to help to determine that other things that can play into that as far as secondary metrics would be you know the time availability of the equipment the facilities the the lifestyle of the person sleep all those other things all those things kind of go into this and it seems like this isn't important when it comes to the ability to auto regulate because what people want to hear me say is hey man if if this doesn't feel right then do this if this doesn't feel right then do this they want those quick easy answers but what i'm saying is we have to determine what doesn't feel right means and if you don't know what that base is for the seventh time, sixth time, then you can't even begin to have that conversation with yourself or a coach if you were using a coach. So now that we have that and there is some base type of program that you're following, if there's that base that you have, you want to be able to look at how you feel going into the training you can rank this on a scale of one to five one to three doesn't really matter you can just write good great suck you know wait, shit suck good great whatever it is how do you feel going into your training and then and if, while you're if you don't know how to already do what i'm speaking about then you should be logging your training and you should be logging notes with your training and part of these notes are going to be how you feel coming in are you excited to train are you not excited to train is it just a neutral you know and i don't care how you quantify it i said one to five one to three or just write a statement then how do you feel after how did the training go and then after the training session what do you think you could have done better what do you think was fucked up what do you think was a mistake what do you think went really good you know write those things down these things are going to become more important than the actual sets and the reps and all the stuff that falls in between because that's going to be able to tell you how you feel after the fact you know and before the fact because at some point in time you're going to have to be able to realize and to, to learn if you go into the gym and you feel tired is that your body telling you that you need a rest or are you just fucking out of shape you know there's there's nuance man there's so much nuance which is where coaching becomes an art form but it also becomes really really hard to do because you're not in the person's head where the you can through a training process you can develop your work capacity there's no doubt about that you can develop your work capacity over time especially if outside stressors can be minimized there was a period when i was in college and i was just doing bodybuilding training uh double splits per day and probably the strongest i ever was but the only i was taking like one fucking class and i was bouncing in a bar and food wasn't an issue and I did stupid. I, you know, I deadlifted 700 for eight, which at the time my best was like fucking a single and a meet before that. You know, all the lifts were through the roof. My work capacity was through the roof. Um, and that was on training twice a day and cardio through the roof, which was not on purpose. It was just how I got to and from class. Is that necessary? Like I can sit there and say, this is great. This is, you know, and brag about it all I want, but it doesn't mean a fucking thing because by the time I went to my next meet, I sucked because there wasn't any transference. But the work capacity can be built to that level, but it's not about how, how high you can build the work capacity is what's the necessary work capacity you need to build to, to be able to get the result that you're looking to get. Where there's a balance there, you know, where there's that recovery balance but on the opposite end of that you can reduce the work capacity so much 
that all you do is one main lift, that's it. The work capacity is going to you know, drop to whatever is required to be able to maintain whatever that ability is. And then if you go to a meet, you can't even get through all three lifts because you're in shitty shape. Or even before that, you're not going to be able to get through your training because you're going to lack the ability to recover from training sessions because the work capacity drops so much. Now, your mind can play tricks on you because as soon as you start dropping some of the work capacity, you start dropping some of the accessory and supplemental exercises, you're going to feel stronger. And you're going to feel stronger because you're essentially, in an indirect way, peaking that lift. So as that lift feels stronger and stronger and stronger, you're thinking, holy shit, I've been doing way too much this whole time. But you forget that it was the base that developed your ability to be able to peak that in the first place. So the point that I'm getting at is sometimes you can't go 100% off how you feel going into the training because you just may not feel like training, but that doesn't mean that you can't train to the highest degree. So there's, there's, there's that, right? So if everybody always went off of that, then most people's training would be shit you know especially the the longer that they're doing something because they're going to look forward to doing it less and less especially the things that they don't like doing they're not going to look forward to and to validate it think through your think through your own training how many times did you go to the gym thinking it was going to be a shitty session but it was an amazing session how many times did you go to the gym thinking it was an amazing session but it was a shitty session so this is why you want to start how do you feel going in how do you feel going out and you start over a period of time you'll start to find some correlations other things that you can use to kind of gauge where this is as far as metrics and correlations can be you know resting heart rate in the morning you can use that to see if there's correlations there's you know you can use an aura ring you there's different any metric that you can use to determine physical state can only help in my opinion as long as you're not using it as a prescriptive measure you're using it as a measure to compare to what actually happened you know so if the state of readiness says that it's going to be shit but yet you went in the gym and it was really good well then just the measurement tool may not be good so there you got to always keep that in mind all you're trying to do is to build data that's easy for you to assimilate to be able to get to a point where you can start regulating some of these different decisions later on in the training and when you use things like your own regular feedback and you know objective measures and you know things that are going to you know how you you can define it's not something else giving you a number or somebody's how i'm trying to say this it, it's not where you're going off of every metric that i would say the aura ring has or every metric that the apple watch is going to have or every metric that a fitbit's going to have and then or your biorhythms or whatever you're going to use to be able to put in there and all that stuff is fucking great to be able to have data but then see again see if that data correlates to what actually happened then over a period of time you'll be able to connect the dots to be able to see these things here yielded a better outcome than the others so the the point that i'm getting to is when there there's too many people that i see that will have their program and they'll either it's from an ebook or a website or something that their coach sends them and they do everything exactly as written and that's a badge of honor you know and and i get kind of where that comes from but who's quantifying if that's the best thing for you to do on that day at that time because they're not in your head you know so if you're going to the gym and you don't feel like you're prepared to train it just feels shitty you know then i'm not telling you to turn around and walk out of the gym but that may be the answer what i'm telling you is start doing some things to see if it's just you fucking with you 
and see if that's what it is and then start to learn the difference between what muscle soreness feels like compared to joint soreness there's a difference muscle soreness for me is going to be more in the muscle belly joint soreness isn't so much in the muscle belly does the soreness as you're warming up go away after a few repetitions of an exercise and then just you know doesn't hurt as much or does it stay with the exercise throughout the whole exercise or set i should say and then does it go away in the second set or is it always there you know determine what this is at least because some of the things you can warm up through it some of the other things you might not be able to and you might have to work around that just that simple thing is going to make big changes in what's going to happen downstream on the training program if it's just a muscle belly soreness and then as you warm up a little bit it goes away and it's not that big of a deal it's probably not going to have that much downstream effect if it's more of joint soreness and no matter what you do it's always kind of there it's going to determine a lot of different things it may determine exercises that you're going to pivot off of the range of motions you might stay out of and all those things matter and if you're just going off what this says on this program you're not making any of those changes so it could be more destructive than what's currently happening and it's definitely not going to help propel you to go forward so with all aspects of training if you're going into say your warm-up so your warm-up very well could be absolutely nothing could be coming in raise the body temperature a little bit just by walking around talking to people and you know start with if it's a squat day just start with body weight squats and move to the bar and then just do as many sets as you have to do with each step up to get ready for the next step up so if it if you're warming up with the bar in your first set the bar hurts then you probably need to do more sets with the bar you want to warm up with the bar until the bar feels like the bar when it feels like an empty bar or then go up and then that would be the same thing if the next set is 95 pounds does it feel like 95 pounds or does it feel like 225 pounds when it feels like 95 pounds go up i don't believe that the repetitions need to be 15 12 or anything like that i'd rather see multiple sets of three five than one set of 15. you know the multiple sets are three to five for me at least and everybody that i know has a better impact in as far as neurally warming them up for what they're going to do with the squat into the later sets and then as as you're warming up do, do you feel how, how you're supposed to feel for whatever the prescripted weight is supposed to be for that day because percentages are going to vary based upon how you feel so if if you feel great i'm not telling you to go over what you're supposed to do but if you feel great cool you know if you feel like shit well then maybe it needs to back down a little bit you have to learn how to gauge that because if we're going to use 70 percent or saying rpe is seven or you know three reps in reserve whatever your whatever that seven is and it's supposed to be sevens for five that day but you come in and you kind of feel like shit but you don't feel so bad that you're you're gonna just call training the warm-ups don't feel great they just feel a little sluggish i'm gonna guarantee whatever you had prescribed for that seven if it was 300 pounds it is not a seven on that day it's probably a fucking eight you know so there's probably a 10 percent variance or 10 percent difference if it's prescribed to be that seven then shouldn't that weight represent whatever that seven is which means it's going to have to go down for that to be what that seven is this is what i'm talking about as far as that ability to auto regulate and be able to get the most out of your training because if you just force shit then you're not on the heavier end then you're not going to be able to recover from it effectively and the training is going to nosedive these are very fucking simple things to be able to do but they're extremely difficult to do an application and the easy answer is to just default and say well that's what it said i was supposed to do that way it takes all personal responsibility and accountability off of you that's where my pushback is going to be well then you really don't take this shit very seriously do you 
because if you did then you're going to do whatever you're supposed to do to be able to yield the highest success possible for whatever going back to my list from the very beginning whatever that main objective is supposed to be as you work through or down your training program that first exercise and how you feel after that first heavy movement is going to determine what's next now you already have a plan of what's supposed to be next but is that adequately what should be next in other words was there was there something that popped up that might need to be addressed right away and to, from my framework that I work from is there a muscle activation problem they don't know how to hold their lats they don't know how to brace that I want to jump on immediately because this is not a muscle weakness per se they just don't know what the fuck they're doing let's jump on that immediately to reinforce that because that's got a higher priority than whatever that secondary movement is going to be because of that so that aside that being more of a rare instance than than not whatever that supplemental exercise is so let's stay with the squat training and for whatever reason your back's a little jacked your lower back's pumped but your second exercise is um stiff leg deadlifts is are you just gonna fucking force doing the stiff leg deadlifts if your back's already pumped to a max like what is the purpose of the stiff leg deadlifts in the first place right not just what is the purpose what are the three give me at least three reasons why they're in there is still doing them satisfying two of those reasons because if it's only satisfying one of those reasons then maybe that exercise at that point should be pulled out and replaced with something else <clears throat> that will fit two of the main reasons why it would be put in there this is auto regulating and when you get deeper into the training program you know repetitions are going to go up because you're moving from supplemental work into accessory work and then a lot of this stuff is going to start to become a lot easier to do because it's it's more along the lines of you start to do an exercise and you don't feel it so if you're if you're supposed to feel in your shoulders whatever you're doing you're not feeling it you're not changing the movement pattern then just do a different exercise if you get to the the hypertrophy based type training or just the movement based training that's later in the training and you're not feeling the exercise the way that you're supposed to feel it then make it so you can so you can slow the tempo you can change the exercise you can decrease the load god forbid you know in but move things around move those metrics around to be able to satisfy the reason the thing is being done in the first place so one of the things you could do that i kind of noted but didn't really note is with each exercise that's in the plan for that day just you can do this the next training session you have there's five movements on there next to the five movements write down the three things that each one of those th just three things that each one of those movements is supposed to help with you to build the main objective of what your training is if you can't list three things then have somebody help you or question why it's there in the first place but there should be at least three reasons that are satisfied that are in there all right and then as you move through the training based upon what your physical state feels like after each exercise because each exercise is a fatiguing variable which is going to lead into whatever the start of that next exercise is if that starts to cancel out more of the reasons of why you're starting to do that next thing replace it because it's not about the thing that you're doing it's about what that thing is supposed to be developing and if that thing isn't developing what it's supposed to be developing then what purpose does it have to still even be done in the first place think about that you know play that over again and think about that these variables and these things make a difference and the more you can be a keen 
to what I'm talking about and start to understand it or just fucking be aware of it. You don't even need to understand it. Just be aware of it. The sooner you're aware of it, the, the sooner it's going to be able to click and you're going to be able to really get what I'm talking about. I can go deeper into this auto regulation thing and will when you guys give me more specific questions you guys being the ones that are on the discord group that are giving me the questions in the first place and um be able to go a little bit deeper with that these are when it's just me spouting out information i'm trying to present this in ways that multiple people can understand based upon where they are in their training hierarchy and these can be a little easier to really get into with more context which i'll be able to get from you guys you know on the discord crew ask the questions or whatever it's called that's on there i don't have it right in front of me but we'll, we'll definitely do that next time because being this the first run i can see where this can be so much better just if i would have asked asked a little bit more context on a couple of these things the the third topic the last topic that i have for today is going to be expanding on the conjugate made simple where with those podcasts that i did and youtube videos and they are in the server under conjugate made easy i think i forget what the hashtag is i should probably have my freaking laptop open with this when i do this as well that would probably be a good idea and i think too owen that we can do this um where they're live like we can schedule it yeah. and then it, we can do that would be pretty fucking cool to do too because then it could be a conversation and drill right into it I just thought of that because there's voice channels yeah. yeah that would be definitely cool um the well with the the squat all i want to focus on are the squat waves i talked about earlier where when i first came to west side there were five week squat waves before i came to west side i trained more than a linear fashion so you could say the squat waves ah you know what because they, they were more four weeks because there are hypertrophy blocks strength blocks peak blocks and strength blocks so i didn't actually put them in the right order but hypertrophy <clears throat> strength power peak I, f I forget now but anyhow there's they're still kind of four week waves in a way but not not as much because they weren't step like loading patterns it was kind of just one long wave loading pattern where west we went from the five week waves down to the three week waves i don't really remember when that happened but i was really happy when it did because i i for me the a couple of those there was one of the weeks felt more like an acclimation week which after i i get that with i say a beginner or an intermediate but after a period of time i don't see what the real relevance of that is unless you've been away from that percentage range for a long period of time it didn't really seem like we needed to be i needed to be reacclimated to it and then the a lot of the times the down the down the deload week or whatever you want to call that the down week seemed too down because the next week that went up so was seemed like a big fucking jump you know so that was one of the things and i understand why d loads are in there don't get me wrong but that was one of the things i really didn't like with that because sometimes you might see you know based upon how strong the lifter is you might see a drop of you know a hundred pounds you know or 150 pounds on the barbell being used and then that next week that drop from that that 150 pound drop ends up being a 220 pound jump because you're not step loading back up from the deload you're just kind of starting where it left off based upon how it's structured and that was kind of a i never really saw the reason of that either because it didn't feel like even if it was an 80 percent or a 70 percent, it's like is this really like a deload because it's it's not because mentally you would go in expecting it to be light because you weren't going to go in mentally the same way that you were going to go in if it was going to be a much heavier weight 
So because you mentally go in prepared a little bit less, the getting back to the auto regulation that I was talking about, the, the, the strain can actually be a little bit more especially on on the recovery because of that so it's really not a recovery thing at least it wasn't for me it wasn't a recovery thing it was harder to the the three weeks seemed to be what was optimal and the more that you look across different people's training programs regardless of what methodology they use three week waves become very significant you know across the board so you know conjugate made simple you know how do you how do i look at the three week waves and what are the different loading patterns for a squat i've done a video before on the bench press on how to determine what percentages you should use and with that i think the video i used 10 pound plates on each side and i did a set of three and just filmed the whole damn thing and when the weights are too light you almost have no control of the barbell because just if you press it with compensatory acceleration so if you if you press it as fast as you can your shoulders gonna be thrown off the bench and you're gonna be flopping around because the weight's just not it's just, it's just too light at a certain point in time that stops and then that force output and the technique starts to look really good and then in the video i would take the i took the chalk and i marked whatever that 10 pound plate was to be able to show this is where shit started to look good and then i throw another dime on each side keep doing triples until the weight started to feel like it was slowing down and it did not feel like i was able to produce the same output that the others felt then i would mark that <laughs> whatever that range was and I don't know what the percentage was for me at the time and I don't even think that's relevant because everybody can do something like this let's say when you look at that and you mark it and you look back you're going to say okay this started to feel really good at about 60 percent and it started to feel like it's starting to get heavy at 70 percent well, there's your three-week wave. 60%, 65% on week two, 70% on week three. There's your three-week wave. There's your optimal for what your physical state is, what your technique is, and all the other things that I listed off as far as the needs analysis and the auto-regulation. There's where you are, right? It does not matter what somebody else says it should be. You just prove to yourself and by filming it, what it is. What it is is always better than what it should be or what somebody else says it's supposed to be. So once that's figured out, and I use the bench as the example, but you can do the same thing on the squat if you don't know, there's your three week wave for just a basic straight weight conjugate wave. If you want to add chains to that, because the chains deload, completely at the bottom you don't have to change the weight just put the chains over top how much chain you put on there is going to base be based upon how strong you are for most people it's going to range between two and maybe four chain per side if you're strong as fuck so most people it's probably going to be a couple chain per side you know maybe maybe three but right around there so it's gonna it's not gonna make that much difference in what you see as far as that trajectory and speed of that barbell but you're gonna no, you're gonna notice it and it should be enough that it's gonna force you to want to come up with a little bit more force than you're gonna have without that if you're going to use bands, then what you want to figure out there is no matter how you set up the bands or how much band tension you use, you know, across the board, you know, I read 20, 25% band tension, but sometimes I think that can become a pain in the ass just trying to figure out how to measure it and all the other things that are associated with it, which on the higher end, that probably does matter and it probably does make a difference and it probably should be known. For the vast majority of people, I don't think so much. What I think is important for you to know, though, 
is how much band tension is going to be at the bottom of the lift. So if it's the squat, how much band tension is on the bottom of the squat? So yes, you can measure that. You can get a fish scale or a deer scale or some kind of scale to kind of measure exactly what that tension is. Whatever that tension is at the bottom, you want to take off the barbell weight right so if you got 40 pounds it'll be more than that so let's say let's say you got 50 50 pounds of band tension at the bottom of the lift then take a quarter off each side of the barbell because that weight's still staying on the bar and that would be for the straight band waves so now we have you know the percentages in the waves for a three-week squat wave and we got the percentage in the wave for just straight band waves and we have the percentage in the chain weight for just the chain stuff so right there you already have fucking a year you know of different chain waves that you can use for the squat and then the same process would go to if it was an ss yoke bar if you already know percentage wise what the difference is between your yoke bar squat and your straight bar squat you already know what to change percentage wise on that barbell to be able to make that the same as what we're talking about the only thing that's not with this made simple thing would be the circ of max and those other phases that speed strength strength speed those things that can be thrown in there where i'm going to make a broad statement and say for 99 percent of the people that are listening to this they don't need those things they just need this shit you know just this things that i'm talking about here one caveat i would throw in with the dynamic work is on on the days where things feel good like keeping it with a squat on the days that you feel every reps just popping man it you feel like you could throw the weight through the fucking ceiling you just boom you just fucking nailing it when you get through your work sets work up a little bit don't be afraid to throw a little weight on you know and what i the way to think about this is let's work out well, let's work up a little bit and see if this popping that you have this this force and speed that you have let's see if it will transfer into some heavier weight and go and work it up and don't miss but just work it up you know work it up you know fairly fairly heavy and not all the time but on those days that it feels good don't be afraid to work it up a little bit you know and, and put it in there now that may mean you know afterwards you might have to reduce some of the accessory training that you're doing but probably not that would be the squat waves made simple with a little bit more context behind it the how you would lay it out for an annual plan and how it would lead into a meet would be a little bit deeper question to be able to look into and i'll touch on it just a little bit but then i'll wait for more context to be able to go further with this if for for most people that that i see and speak to and see out here some of the things that need changed based upon my opinion and what i see is to move them off the box for at least one wave out from the meat and then having the um, so they'll have the free squat so they'll have the, the waves are going to lead up into the meat so either the band tension may increase a little bit or the chains may increase a little bit or even your percentages may increase a little bit kind of leading up into that meat type of striking striking range and then when you get four weeks out from that it's not going to be that three week wave one week download and then go to the meat it may be dropping the box out and then from there it 
For a lot of people, it may just be simply no box and slight progressive overload working back from where their opener is going to be for a couple sets of three or a couple sets of two. Preferably, it depends upon the lifter. I'd rather see singles, but the problem with singles when you're dealing with novices and um, beginners is you're not going to be able to get the workload because unless they want to stay there all fucking day uh the more advanced because the singles are going to give them more preparedness as far as the the competition lift you know where one of the discussions i had with the podcast with oh shit my brain's going to shit who was out here just last time i feel bad now I feel so bad. Yeah. Oh, my God. I got to look it up because I feel bad right now. Man, this shows you that it's fucking Friday, right? It's Friday, right? It's Kevin Can. Yeah, well, what was it? Kevin Can. Kevin Can. I'm sorry, Kevin. Um, it's fucking Friday. And, um, but one of the things that we were talking about was the, the definition of a comp lift. And just when you start speaking about specificity things like this matter to me you know so if you're going to say that it's a comp lift then how do you define that you know to me if they got to walk it out then a comp lift is you know really from the time period that they step on the platform you know and can be timed out for not grabbing the bar you know to getting under the bar walking the bar out getting the squat from a command standing getting a rack command and putting it back in that is a comp lift that whole thing now when you take that walk out so if they did two reps only actually none of them to me is a comp if they did two or three reps not one of those is a comp lift because the third rep is where they walked it back in if they were even given a rack command you know so if we're going to speak about specificity of comp lifts and it's a true beginner then those singles are going to probably have more impact because you have to work on this skill and you don't want that to be the experience they're going to have when they go to a meet there's nothing fucking worse than missing a lift because you didn't wait for the freaking rack command or you know squatting a weight that you just smash but you get red lights because you didn't wait for this you know a squat command you know so that specificity is going to based upon is what how you want to define that on the level of the lifter going into that so you're already starting to see why i'm saying the last four weeks five weeks whatever that's going to be going into the meet is going to change based upon who the lifter specifically is what they're dealing with you know on the higher end say it's a more advanced lifter and their bicep tendonitis and their shoulders are just fucked then you have to be very very conservative not you have to be very tactful on when you're going to do these because that problem isn't going to go away until after the meet and you don't want them to go into the meet with it being as as inflamed at max level you want them to go into the meet with it good enough that they might feel like shit after the meet but they're able to at least get all their lifts and prs on their lifts so that's where we can have a more um deeper conversation based upon specific context i'm going to shut this down here guys i don't know how long this was um, but this was a sample and it will get better of what the crew only table talk podcast is going to be like for the, you guys that aren't not already a member of the crew go to the description and click join the crew when they join the crew you also become part of our discord server our discord server we just upgraded and it is packed full of resources i've been a part of many many different paywalls over the years and i, I don't even like using that word uh, member sites over the years nothing compares to as far as content what we have on there it's in its structure in a way that yeah you're going to probably feel overwhelmed at first because there is a boatload of content on there but it is easy to find we just put it down there we just put a, a better search on there for the content that's there the community is amazing the form checks are awesome 
anytime somebody puts a form check up, multiple people are checking these things. And anytime I go in, I've not yet found anything that was fucked up on a form check. Most of the time, I'm just hitting the thumbs up. This is the only social media I actually have notifications turned on on my phone. So I am watching this. And this is where the questions are going to come in for the crew only podcast. There's there's programs on there. There's workouts on there. I just started keeping my training log, which is going to be interesting to follow on there. And some of our team members will start keeping their training logs. We got more team elite FTS members that have come on to be able to help with the Q&A. And I can keep going on and on and on with this. But it is a valuable resource and it helps support the podcast. The reason you guys are able to actually see the podcast you heard me bitch for what two years you know about the podcast is because of the support that we get from the crew it's because of the support that we're getting from our sponsors and it's because we have a staff that busts their ass to be able to put this stuff out for you guys so with that all in mind thank you and we're done Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drink one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash table talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk money back guarantee head over to trankelement.com backslash table talk today's episode is brought to you by first detachment are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hard-working athletes look no further than first detachment wendy's real world experience is what i would consider and they consider battle tested i have known justin harris for pretty close to two decades and if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description.